Welcome to Africa's LSP podcast, where we explore the world of translation, interpretation, and localization, as well as connect with the language industry's top players. From language service providers to the businesses and individuals who rely on their services, we'll be delving into the challenges, opportunities, and trends shaping the industry. Join us as we discover the power of language and the impact it has on connecting Africa and the world. Brought to you by Bolingo Consult, Africa's LSP podcast is the go-to podcast for all things language in Africa. Oftentimes, when you mention project management in low-resource locales, especially in the context of Africa, it comes with peculiar challenges. And the most common challenge that localization project managers face include communicating effectively with language professionals, managing workflows, and deadlines. And so we're excited to announce to you that we have a young lady here to tell us about all of that and what she does to overcome it. We are glad you have made the time to join us on another edition of Africa's LSP podcast. My name is Grace Hamwa Ajiman, and it's good to have you. Mary Nanafi is project manager of Bolingo Consult. Mary, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you, Grace. I'm glad to be here. Project management in low-resource locales is something that needs to be talked about more often because I believe that the more we talk about it, the more we have the ability to um, work on them and make sure that they are no longer classified as such. So I'm excited to be here to speak on this topic. We're also happy to have you on our show. We want to get up close and personal with you. Tell us a bit about yourself, what you do, where you grew up, and all of that. Okay. As everybody already knows, I'm Mary Nanafi. I was born here in Accra, and I still live here in Accra, but I am an Ewe, and I'm from Bando in the Vota region. Um, in my free time, I like to read books and watch anime as well. Sometimes I just watch movies or series just to pass the time to while the time away. Yeah. Your name, Nanafi, strikes a bell in my mind. Tell us a bit about the name, Probably um, what it means. Okay. So Nanafi um, originally is mentioned as Nanafi, right? It's Nanafi. And throughout the years, we've come to notice that a lot of people can't say the, the mm-hmm. initial sound of Nga. So we, we changed it to Nanafi. That was much easier for people to mention. The name itself can be broken down into two parts. It's Nanafi. So it means um, in a way you would say Nungane Ofine. And when you translate that into English, it um, comes out as one who likes sweet things or nice things or one who steals these things. Mm. That is the way we um, translate it. And this is because uh, my forefathers, I would like to say, were warriors and they were conquerors. So when they conquered any town or any village, they would um, acquire the belongings of these people and take it as their own. Mm. So I think that's where um, the name comes from. Yes, I get it because I know that PFP yes. is something that's got to do with exactly. people stealing. Yeah. Yay, I'm getting my error right. <laughs> so <laughs> let's go into the nitty gritty of what you do. Tell us a bit about what you specifically do at Bolingo Consult as a project manager. What do you specifically manage? So at Bolingo Consult, um, I manage translation projects, interpretation projects, uh, media localization. Um, sometimes I also do um, desktop publishing. So with translation projects, we usually have clients who require documents in English or in any other language to be translated into a different language. So when this comes in, sometimes we have to localize. So we ask the clients that what dialects of the language do you want? Which region do you want it from? We take a look at that and then we work on it according to the requirements that they provide. When it comes to interpretation, we do on-site and then remote interpretation. So as on-site is, I guess, obvious, we go to wherever the meeting is being held, we set up and then we provide interpretation uh, services right there. With remotes, we are here, we are wherever we are across the globe, and then we provide the services via any online tool. Sometimes it's Zoom. 
which we mostly use because it provides that feature. But whenever it's needed, whichever tool our client feels they are more comfortable with, we try to accommodate. Media localization, it's mostly subtitling. And with desktop publishing, it's when clients bring in um, documents that are in a specific format that we need to pay attention to and make sure that we reproduce it, but with the target's language in the same format that they gave us. You sound very excited and on top of your game. Tell us, being in the language services industry, have you always wanted to be here or life put you here? Right. So this question is very interesting because in the university, I studied French and linguistics. But at the time, I didn't think that I would be in a project management role at all. And I studied those particular courses because I had an interest in languages. I wanted to learn more about languages. It's something that I enjoy. But after that, I took a course in project management, but not specifically to work in the languages industry. I just wanted to do project management in the broader scale, so to speak. But whilst searching for roles that um, cater to my skill set, I ended up here at Bolingo Consult as a project manager for you know, languages, it's been quite an interesting journey. Yeah. I was going to ask you to describe your stay here in just a word. You just said interesting. Yeah. Which other word would you use? Maybe two. Two words. Two words. Mm. So uh, interesting and exciting. Great. What strategies then do you adapt to promote collaboration in your field of work? Uh, so in my field of work, I try to leave an open line of communication and transparency as well. Always make sure that the linguists that I'm working with on a particular project have the ability to access me when they need to do so in a way that is more convenient for them. So sometimes it could be via email or WhatsApp or a phone call, whichever one is easier for them to do at any point in time in the day. So when you're a project manager in the localization industry, one thing you tend to realize is there is no such time as alone time because you always have linguists calling you. They want to understand the context behind something that they are working on and you have to be available or it could cause a delay. That's one thing. And transparency. You have to make sure that you are as transparent with them as possible on everything that is happening throughout the project. You have to align um, you and the linguists on the objectives of that particular project. There is nothing that should be um, seen as need to know basis because if they if you are transparent and then they know what you are they are working on and they understand the import of it it helps them to work better and to keep in mind the context with which to work in and produce the best or the highest quality target or document what challenges do localization projects managers face particularly in africa when working on projects with low resource locals but before you even get to that what do you mean by low resource locals? Then you can answer the other question. Okay, so a low resource locale is a language that lacks linguistic resources to train automated translation systems, right? So in Africa, you would realize that there's a, a problem of having an inadequate talent pool. For example, a writer in Ghana, tree is not a language that a lot of people take or a lot of people treat as a language that could take them to um, a higher professional level. Chi is frowned upon in school. You can't speak vernacular or you get punished. But in doing this, you realize that you don't have professionals who are qualified enough to work in these languages and produce the documents in the best quality. So you have people coming in, uh, they say, I speak Chi, but you can't write Chi. Or you can't translate from to English or vice versa. And this is a big problem because sometimes you have a translator who uh, is good at it, right? They are qualified, but then you need a reviewer to have a look at it and make sure that it is exactly what it needs to be and it is according to the specifications of the client. And this poses a big challenge. So many languages in Africa have this very same problem and it can be quite hectic as a project manager when you're working with some of these languages. Another thing is communication. Like I said before, if we don't understand each other, it's going to be a very, very difficult process. So um, one thing that I would commend Bolingo Consult for is that sometime last year, 
we branched out to Rwanda and we set up an office there. And Adi proposed that we have a workshop, so to speak, with a cultural expert in Rwanda to help us understand the culture of the people there and then the nuances when that come with working with them. And I must say that it has been very, very insightful and very helpful so far because since then I've had to work with people from Rwanda or people who speak Kenya Rwanda. And now I understand that when they speak, you need to read between the lines. There is nothing that is straightforward. And they also have a cultural thing that they don't speak a certain way to people that are above them in a position or they don't speak a certain way to people that are older than them. So, for instance, if someone from Rwanda can be working with me, right? And they may be older than me. To them, it doesn't make a difference. Yes, they are older than me, but I'm still the person who is in charge. Meanwhile, in other cultures, just because you are work- somebody is older than somebody they're working for, they tend to not give them as much respect because they think I'm older than you. So even though you're in a higher position, you are supposed to give me the respect. And that's, and that's a problem. So understanding these cultural nuances, right, gives you the ability to speak to them um, in a way that is easier for them to understand and digest. And in doing so, it impacts the project or the task they're working on in a much better way because then they understand what they're supposed to do, when they're supposed to do it, and when they should be done by. So that's something that is um, a challenge but can also be rectified if we have the right mindset. Uh, another challenge is environmental factors, economic fluctuations. So sometimes you realize that they are working with a linguist and the deadline is tomorrow, it's early in the morning, you need to submit the document to the client, but the linguist is telling you that I don't have light. I don't have access to internet, so I can't complete it in time. It leaves you, the project manager, open to uh, a lot of issues because you can't complete the task when you told the client you've completed. It's a big challenge that we have and to fix such a problem, it's always better to have a backup plan. So, yes, you may be working with one linguist, but sometimes you have to consider the fact that they may not always be available or they may not be able to complete it within the period of time that you give them. So you need to find somebody else who is also available during that same time to do the work they need to do. Or if that's not a possibility because there's not enough resources, you can always just inform the client that this is there's going to be a slight delay. Um, we apologize, but... We assure you, you would have it by this period of time or by tomorrow or the day after. Yeah, exactly. So those are just a few challenges that we face. Mary, you keep mentioning the linguists, the linguists, the linguists, the linguists. How do you come by them? How do you source these linguists? So I would say that uh, sourcing of linguists is usually not my expertise. We have Alberta um, at Bolingo Consult here, who is the human resources or the vendor manager. So she's the one who usually has to source linguists. But on some of days, um, I would have to also source them to assist because it might be something that might um, need immediate attention. And uh, the more hands we have, the quicker we are able to find who we need. So when we are sourcing for linguists, we usually go to some platforms that provide these services. So um, one good one that I usually use is pros.com, where you have linguists who work with different different language pairs they all also on they have profiles and on these profiles they already have the rates that they take they already have the the language pairs that they work with uh, some of them also have their contact information their qualifications so you're able to see who can provide you the best uh service and you're able to reach out to these people sometimes too you you can just go to linkedin you go to linkedin you put in a keyword uh i can or maybe Kenya Rwanda or French, Spanish. Some of these people have the language they work with on their profiles, or it might just be translator. So you can just put in translator or interpreter and it pops up. Then you can filter according to region or you can filter according to um, the country that you want them to have the expertise with. And in doing so, you are able to find some of these people. But when it comes to low resource locales, languages that are much harder to find, it's always best to have 
um, interact with people that could be on the ground, right? So maybe you need uh, a, uh, a language from a country like, um, let's say, Ethiopia, right? And in this country, when you go, you, you can't go there yourself, right? And you could search for them online from morning to night and you won't find anybody that you are looking for. So it's always just best to reach out to people that you might know in these regions or people who might know people in these regions. So it's all about finding networks. So I know somebody and then that somebody knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. And usually that's the way we go about it. Yeah. And once you find um, the contact details of these people, it's the first things we ask for is your CV. So I would advise that if you're a linguist, language specialist, please always make sure to update your CV with the languages you worked on or the past projects that you've worked on so that once you send it to us, we're able to see what qualifications you have and also take them into consideration when figuring out where to put you. These are things that we put into consideration. So sometimes you would have um, a call out, right, for people who provide services in a particular language pair. And you will find that a lot of these, the people that actually respond to these um, calls for these applications don't actually have any experience in their language. They didn't study for it. They didn't study to be translators. They didn't study to be interpreters. Uh, they, didn't, they don't have any um, experience working in the language, but they claim to be linguists. Now, you can't... I understand that some everyone has to start from somewhere, but I would advise that before you um, label yourself as a professional linguist or as a professional language specialist, you have some sort of background. Having a degree is great. Having a PhD or a master's is amazing. Um, having some experience, any experience at all, um, translating documents. So this is something you might consider doing internships at different places that need translators or interpreters. So you might find that your local um, your local church, they need interpreters. That's a great place to start. They need translators. They need people who can um, give them the ability to bridge that gap that they may be facing in the community. Amazing. Put that on your CV. Send it to us. And once we review it, we might take you through a test. You pass and there you go. We have a request for your language. We let you know. And then we begin working on it. So that's um, those are some of the few ways that we source for linguists. And as I said, please learn the, learn the languages so that when we are looking for you, it's much easier for us. Well, so to our listeners out there, when you enter Bolingo Consult, Mary is probably one of the first people you see behind her desk. Tell you what, the first time I came here, I saw, I'm like, who is this lady who is so busy behind a computer? with her headphones so big around her ears. I now understand why she's always behind her computer because she has to go through all of these challenges and still deliver on time to make sure the client is satisfied. Mary, big ups to you. Thank you. I won't judge you no more. I now <laughs> understand why you're always behind your computer. So tell us how you navigate your way through these challenges. What are the strategies you've adopted over the time? to go through these challenges and make sure you deliver on time to your clients. So to mitigate some of these challenges or to find ways and means around it, I've come to realize that when it comes to communication, like I said, I always make sure to have a conversation with the linguists before we start a project to understand what their mindset is and what they require to be able to complete it in time. And it's a big time saver because they can tell you that this week, I know that I won't have light for this period of time. So if you're going to inform the client when the deadline is going to be, you should put a little bit of a buffer so that you can um, make up for that lost time. And it's really, really helpful because if I understand when the deadline is going to be, I don't, have to, I don't have to panic when it's closed and then I realize that maybe we need to push back a little because I'm aware. I know this is a possibility or this could happen. And in informing me too, you've let me know that I need to find somebody else who can also assist when you're not available so that we can all make up the time that has been lost. And it's very, very helpful. Um, another thing too is to always put into consideration the tools that you're going to use, right? So in the localization industry, we have um, tools that we call CAT tools that 
we use in our day-to-day processes. So sometimes when you are working on a project, a, a client might come to you and say that, I want you to use this particular tool, it, nothing else. And you don't have a choice. Maybe you've not seen it before. You've not worked with it before. And you have no choice but to learn it because that's the requirement. And in Africa, you would realize that a lot of linguists and language specialists don't know how to use these CAD tools. They are not technologically savvy, right? People who know, especially low resource locales, you find that those who are really, really good at it or people who have the qualifications to work on those languages are of the older generation. And they find it a bit difficult to navigate around computers and technology. It can be quite tedious, let me tell you. But sometimes you just have to sit with them and walk them through it. So usually what we do is we have a training session. We tell them that this is the software we are going to use, if it is. Um, and most of them are online. So you don't have to install anything, no long processes. You just go to the platform, you sign up or you sign in if you already have an account. And then we walk you through the processes. We let you know this is where you need to go to access what you need to work on. And then in doing so, they get used to it. And then there's no longer that barrier of, um, I don't know how to do it. I haven't used it before. And then it makes the process smooth. And I, one thing I would love to say is that for my language specialists and for my linguists out there who may be listening, please and please again, let's all try as much as possible to learn how to use some of these CAT tools because they are not that different, right? So you may be well-versed with one CAT tool, but it's not so different from the next one that you may not be able to navigate or find your way around it. So we should always be open to working with new technology as and when it comes in because the the space is evolving the industry is evolving the world is evolving and i believe that we all need to keep that in mind and then run with it as much as possible that brings me right to my next question the world is changing client needs are growing almost every day tell us some of the tools you've had to adopt or even the skills you've had to adopt to your already existing skill set that help you meet the demands of your clients. Maybe somebody will pick one or two from you. There are a, a lot of them out there and they're very helpful because once I put or I upload the project into one of these CAT tools, I'm able to set a deadline, which the linguist can see. I'm able to set the language, which the linguist can see because sometimes these languages come with different regions. So it could be Spanish, but Spanish from a specific region. It could be from Mexico, or another part of the region. So it's something that is very, very helpful. And I, it also helps me follow the progress of the linguist. So sometimes that is the best way to know whether you're going to make the deadline or not. Because I can see two days to the deadline that the linguist hasn't even started. Then I know that I have to find ways and means to make up for all the missed time that he was supposed to be working. So you you take a look at some of these tools and then they are very, very helpful in um, managing day-to-day projects, managing um, several projects at the same time. It's also very helpful because on a day, on a very busy day here in Bolingo Consults, I can be working on three, five projects at the same time. I won't be surprised. <laughs> right. So you got, you can imagine, some of them have varying volumes as well. You can have 11,000 words. You can have 100,000 words. But you can also have a little, as, a little as 20 words. And you need to be on top of your game with each and every one of them throughout your day. So using these CAD tools is very, very helpful. If I can see what is happening in real time, then I can make plans to uh, mitigate challenges that may arise during the course of the project or the task that is being worked on. Also, uh, one thing, one skill that I've had to perfect is being able to um, communicate effectively with... Oh, okay, no, communicating effectively is not the right the right phrase to use um i've learned how to be more diplomatic in my speaking i would say because you realize that a lot of people can take offense from the smallest things so you need to be um diplomatic in the way you speak you need to be more nuanced you 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 need to be more subtle about the way you want to say certain things you know so that they don't take offense or they don't see it a different way so that's one skill i'm very proud of so now i can speak to people and um you know, they, they, they take the best part of what I want to see and everything else is just in the background. Let's go back to the Rwanda example of giving respect to who respect is due. Have you come across in any in any time 
in your field of work, the gender divide, where somebody says, okay, you are the project manager, yes, but you're a woman and you can't order me around or you can't do this to me. Does it, has it come up in any way? I have had the privilege of never experiencing that, I would say, because um, I feel when working with some of these linguists from these various regions, they don't have any gender bias. Well, in my case, I haven't seen them use it in with me. Did you get? So I haven't had anybody say, oh, you're a woman, so I can't work with you, or you are younger than me, so I can't work with you. Usually they don't even know how old I am or they don't see my age or what age group I'm in. So it's usually irrelevant. All they need to know is I'm the one managing this project. Um, It needs to be done by this time in this language. And that's that. But I guess in some situations, you might have the... Um, you might have something come up such as, let's say, uh, let me look for a very good example. So um, I had the opportunity to work with some linguist right here in Ghana. And these people thought I was demanding because I asked them to do what they were required to do. The clients came in with a task with very, very, very specific instructions. I mean, it was an entire page of instructions that you have to look at meticulously to make sure that you follow each and every one of them as much as possible. Because if you don't, they'll keep coming back. And it's not a good look for us as the people who are working or relating with them. And it's not a good look for you, the linguist. So I try as much as possible to make the process smooth for everyone. I explain the instructions and I let them know that if at any point in time there's an instruction you don't understand, you can always come to me and I'll be willing to assist you. But in the end, I they ended up su- submitting the, the final document, right? And... It was a group of people. Some of the linguists submitted it. It was great because they followed all the instructions that were provided. But then I had one specific person and they didn't even bother to, it's like they didn't even bother to read the, the requirements that was given. They didn't read the instructions. And because of that, it caused a delay. So I sent um, information to the client letting them know that we have some of them ready, but they might have to wait a bit to get the rest of the documents. And then I reached out to the linguist, letting them know that, hey, this is the situation. You didn't do the work um, according to the instructions or the requirements that were given. So you need to redo it or just fill in the ones that you didn't do correctly because there's comments everywhere. And then you can just resolve it in the shortest possible time. And we can all have a happy day and deliver in the sh- in the easiest possible way. But... For them, it was me being too, I was nitpicky to them. So I, so they felt I was being difficult because I didn't want to slack on the quality of the document or the quality of the text that they were working on. And I, I had to keep being back and forth with this person. They would come to me that, hey, I'm done. I would check and it's still the same thing. They didn't even bother to change anything. Hey, I'm done. Still the same thing. We had to do this back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Till eventually, they stopped even talking to me or replying to my messages. And then they were talking to somebody else who was also, um, you know, familiar with the project because they felt maybe I was being some way about it. But I, I don't know. I did see it that way. But I guess that's an instance where I've had to deal with maybe this kind of um, situation. But other than that, uh, everything else has been good. So what I get from your explanation is that you have to be somebody who pays a lot of attention to detail to thrive in this area. Yeah. Apart from that, what other, let's say, three qualities would you um, say you should possess before you can be in this industry? Maybe your top three, apart from paying attention to details. Yes. So apart from that, um, another quality you need is time management. Because if you can't manage your time, you're always going to be behind on everything. You need to make sure that you have a system for managing your time so that everything is worked on when it needs to be worked on and there's nothing left behind. Uh, Another thing is organization. You need to know where everything is at all times. You need to know where, what level this task is at or you need to know what period of time uh, is left for this one to be complete. You need to know where this document is. You need to know where this 
document has to go right after it's completed here. You need to know who needs to work on what. It's a it's a whole thing, but um, I believe when you get used to it or you've been working with it for quite some time, you get really good at it because you don't really have a choice. So yes, those are two things. So time management, organization, being attentive to details and also negotiation. So if you look at all the hurdles and the challenges and all the headaches and stress that your work comes with. And a little girl walks up to you and says, Mary, I love the work that you do. I'd want to enter the industry and do the same thing that you're doing. Would you advise that young girl to still do the same thing? Yes, I would 100% advise them to do the same thing because, like I said before, I love languages. I don't know why. I don't know. Maybe it was because of the household I grew up in. I mean, I grew up in an Ewe household, but I went to a school where I had to learn Ga. Then I went to another school where I had to learn Chi. Then at the end of the day, I went to university and I went to learn French. So for me, languages is something that is very dear to me. And also, I love what Bolingo Quantot is doing because our vision here is to raise the profile of African languages, right? To make sure that it's something that we cherish. It's something that we advocate for. It's something that we make sure people everywhere around the world understands that this is our language. We can communicate in it. We are um, fluent in it. We are proud of it. And it's it's something that is a part of our heritage. I mean, I don't, I'm an Ewe, like I said before. I love telling people I'm an Ewe. And sometimes I don't even need to tell people I'm an Ewe because they can tell. But... For some people, their language is not something that they are very fond of or it's not something they are very proud of. And I, and I would say that that is a mindset that we need to let go of as um, people that have diverse backgrounds and diverse languages. Someone can be born into a household with two, three languages, right? They have to learn all of them and they feel one is more superior to the other, which is not the case at all. Because all of our languages are beautiful. They need to be preserved and we need to show how proud we are of them. So I would tell this little girl that, yes, uh, my job can be a bit hectic sometimes because some days you can't sleep. There's so much going on at the same time. But there is a, a certain type of joy and fulfillment in knowing that the work you are doing is affecting people, so many people around the world, right? There are people in far, far away countries where their language is spoken and they are in a foreign man's land with nobody to help them understand um, how to go about their day-to-day lives but with the services that we provide they are able to get the help they need so to speak because there is an airway man or there is somebody who speaks Swahili but they are in Spain at the moment so they need an interpreter that's what we do to make this person feel comfortable and welcome in the country they are in even though there's there might be no one around them who speaks their language so it helps it makes a big big impact because we are trying to, like I said, we are raising the profile of these languages around the world. Now we have more and more requests from um, companies across the globe, other than Africa, who are requesting for African languages. You, you, you want, you find that some of them want languages from um, parts of Af- Africa that one might think are obscure, right? Uh, but that's the job that we are doing. If we don't bring these languages to the limelight they won't be taken as seriously or they may not be considered um, languages that need to be preserved. So it's always um, a good feeling to have. And I, I can say that it's worth all the, the stress and the challenges that you have to go through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Mary, I should be wrapping up with you, but from your experiences on the field, would you say that the collection of African languages we have now are languages that are in demand based on the requests that you get from your clients? I would say that some or most African languages are in demand um, because we have a recurring request every single day, every single month. And um, I would encourage as many people as possible to start taking pride in their languages. Learn your language, you know, be more interested, be more inquisitive because if you learn your language and you're good at it and you can read, you can write it, you know the code, the cultural nuances of it, you understand the different contexts of your language. You can always enter the languages industry as a translator or as an interpreter. It's always great to have a degree um, in the language that you want to translate for or interpret for. 
So it's important, you know, it's in, it, it's interesting to see. And I would say that, yeah, it's it's in demand. So learn it so that you can also make money because money is very good. Great. Money is very good. Yeah. So before you go, I want you to send out a message to our listeners in your Ghanaian language or in your African language. Any message, any goodwill message. So let us know what you're going to say in English and then say it in no way. Yeah, that's that. So I, uh, what I'm going to be saying is thank you for um, joining us here today, for listening to um, Africa's LSP podcast and for also um, joining us here at Bolingo Consult. So I want everyone to know that they should be proud of their local language and they should be um, interested in propagating it um, to others so that they can also enjoy their languages as well. podcast. consult. I mean, I, I heard a few, you know, I used to speak a little bit, but I forgot it because I don't get people to speak with anymore. That's so I became a bit rusty, but I know that enyo means it's good. Yes. Opete means everybody or everyone or anything should love it. Yes. So um, my hour is still there. Maybe when we keep speaking it, I'll get back on track. 100%. F1. <laughs> so we have been speaking with Mary Nanafi, who is a project manager here at Bolingo Consult. She took us to her world, what she does as a project manager for Low Resource Local. And I know you and I have, far from having an interesting conversation with her, have also learned a thing or two. At least you should know that before you can become a successful project manager, you must pay attention to details have a penchant for proper time management and be able to know how to negotiate. She tells me the money in the industry is good. And so I mean, if the money <laughs> if the money in the industry is good, why not enter into it? Thank you so much for joining us, Mary. We've learned a lot from you. And thank you also to you out there for joining us and being a part of the conversation. This has been another exciting episode of Africa's LSP podcast brought to you by Bolingo Consults. My name is Grace Hamwa Ajiman. Let us know how you feel about this conversation in the comment section. We'll come your way again, same time, with another edition. This bye-bye from us. But Mary, how do you say bye-bye in a way? Is there a word for it? So we don't have a singular word for bye-bye in a way. Usually we say bye-bye according to maybe the relationship we have with the person or the social um, situation that is present, right? So um, I think because we would love to interact with our listeners next time, uh, Miyadogo is perfect. Okay, so from Mary, myself, and the Bolingo Consult, we say Miyadogo. See you in our next episode. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to Africa's LSB podcast. We hope you enjoyed the conversation and learned something new. For feedback or inquiries, reach out to us at podcast at bolingoconsult.com. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review us on your favorite platforms. Until next time, stay curious and keep growing.